Welcome to another of our discussions on the book of Isaiah. Today we'll be discussing chapters 36 and 37. Joining me today are my colleagues from religious education. Uh, Jeff Chadwick from uh, Church History and Doctrine, Ray Huntington from Ancient Scripture, and Ann Madsen also from Ancient Scripture, and I'm Paul Hoskison from Ancient Scripture. We need to say here at the beginning of this discussion on chapters 36 and 37 that this is his historical material which has been inserted here into Isaiah because it, it uh, concerns some uh, uh, historical happenings in Isaiah's day. And they're parallel, if you notice, in, your King in, in our LDS edition uh, in 2 Kings 18. And before we get into this historical material, I think it's important, though, that we also set the stage for the times in which this is happening. So that in verse 1, it reads, And now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defensed cities of Judah and took them. Paul, um, it's interesting in this passage that we get a specific chronological datum that we can fix ourselves to, the 14th year of King Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah is noted both in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles as one of the righteous kings of Judah. We, uh, we now uh, chronologically fix the beginning of his sole regency over Judah in the year 715. In the 14th year of his reign, it would be 701 B.C., and that's when the adventure in chapters 36 and 37 takes place. Prior to, But you mentioned that this was a, a sole regency began then. So he, he reigned together with his father prior to that time? He had. He had reigned with his father Ahaz uh, since uh, early in the 720s B.C. And but, what's happening uh, around them uh, in that time period, say 725 down to 715? Well, of course, you'd already experienced two deportations, heavy deportations of the northern king of Israel by, by the uh, Assyrian kings uh, Tiglath-Pileser III, uh, uh, Shalmaneser V and Sargon II. And so a great number of Israelites, uh, possibly as high as the hundreds of thousands, had been taken away and deported from the land. Judah is the only Israelite kingdom remaining. So Hezekiah would have been aware of these uh, Assyrian deportations of the northern tribes. Uh, oh, he saw his northern neighbor be conquered and deported away by the Assyrians. Yep. And he himself had determined that he would try to change the nature of Judean life to be more in tune with the, with the commandments that are found in, in our Bible. So he um, abolished the worship of foreign gods. He tried to uh, convince the people of Judah to worship only the Lord God of Israel, Jehovah. He reinstituted the Passover. He um, determined at a certain point, uh, as we're coming down, uh, probably about the year 705, that he would not continue the alliance with Assyria that his father Ahaz had, uh, had contracted. So in 705, he essentially rebelled and didn't send the tribute to Assyria. Was there, something, was there something else that happened in 705 that might have precipitated his rebellion? Well, of course, uh, uh, Sargon II died. The king of Assyria died, and so this was a good time to break off the uh, relationship. This may have been a time when other uh, countries uh, who were subservient to the Assyrians also might have rebelled. Quite probably Assyria. Babylon and then some of the yeah, rest. Okay. In preparing for this uh, break off of relations, Hezekiah had had food storage programs and uh, and uh, fortifications uh, built around the many cities of Judah. It even had a new wall around Jerusalem and the famous Hezekiah's Tunnel dug to provide water for the city. I, I was just going to ask. This is the time period then when Hezekiah's Tunnel would have been uh, right. Uh, constructed this marvel of the ancient world. Mm -hmm. So we're approaching 701. Sennacherib has finally uh, got himself uh, ensconced as, as the king of Assyria. He brings his forces to Judah. And as you read in verse 1, in that 14th year of Hezekiah, 701 BC, Sennacherib came up against all the defensed, meaning the walled cities of Judah, and took them, which means that he conquered all of the cities of Judah destroyed them and deported their inhabitants. This was a devastating blow for the nation. So this is in addition to the Assyrian deportation of the northern tribes. Right. Now, 
90% of the population of Judah has been conquered and deported away, a fact that we don't often discuss in our Sunday school lessons. No, and it's, it's amazing to think that there was Jerusalem, like, a, and Isaiah mentions this, uh, just alone, really isolated. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem without those defensive cities that were put there to defend Jerusalem in any war, and they were all gone. I mean, uh, Sennacherib later talks about them as a bird in a cage. Is that what he says? Yes, I'm going to read a passage from uh, Sennacherib's and uh, annals that talk about that. You know, just uh, going along with what Anne said, uh, something that uh, I was thinking about the other day when I was looking at this chapter is, uh, here, here's a great king, perhaps the most righteous king of any of the kings of Judah. Hezekiah. Hezekiah. And, and he's placed his trust in God. Okay? He's, he's laying it all out on the table. I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to try to turn things around, as, as Jeff talked about a little yeah. bit earlier. But in the process, look at what is happening to his kingdom. It's being dismantled by the Assyrians. And in a sense, it's going to test Hezekiah's faith. Will oh. he remain faithful? Is he going to hang in there? Is he, is he, is he you know, ultimately, the, the, the faith test here will come to pass because Jerusalem, as you said, will be defended. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and with that, thank you. Uh, it's a nice one. lead into the next section that we want to deal with. That's verses 4 uh, through 10 in uh, chapter 36, where the officials, uh, as your footnote uh, uh, says there, the chief of the officers uh, uh, of the Assyrians is sent by Sennacherib to Jerusalem to bargain with them to see if he can't get Jerusalem to capitulate because Sennacherib has already captured uh, most of the other cities. He will eventually capture all of them, but he's probably still at Lachish, which is the second most uh, fortified city in all of Judea, and that will eventually fall too. But in the meantime, he wants to see if he can negotiate a surrender for Jerusalem. Well, in Assyria, it was always um, their strategy to terrorize the people ahead of time to come down and say, remember what we did to them and to them and to them? Yes. We're coming to your gate now. We're here. You better talk to us. <laughs> this is intimidation in its rawest form. It really <laughs> is. It is intimidation. And I thought I would take just a minute to read a little bit out of uh, Sennacherib's own annals as he reported this story that we have here in Isaiah. And you'll get a little bit of a feel for his pride and the glory that he thinks he has. And you'll also get a slightly different feel for what's going on at the siege of Jerusalem from uh, what we have here. But they dovetail very nicely. The uh, annals of Sennacherib begin, I am Sennacherib, the great king, the powerful king, the king of all there is, the king of the city and land of Ashur, the king of the four quarters, meaning the king of the whole world, the capable shepherd, the favorite of the great gods, the protector of truth, a lover of righteousness, an accomplisher of help, the companion of the disadvantaged, the striver after goodness, the perfect man, the heroic male, the foremost of all kings, the one who yokes the unwilling, the dasher of my enemies, the god Asher, the great mountain bestowed on me kingship without compare. Then going on to the part where he discusses his, uh, the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem, he says, as for Hezekiah of the land of Judea, who did not submit to my yoke, and remember that Hezekiah had rebelled against the Assyrians by refusing to pay the taxes which, were, uh, which he was supposed to pay annually. Forty-six of his fortified cities, walled outposts, and countless villages in their districts, I surrounded with packed earth and with siege engines and battle troops and sappers and miners and shock troops. I sacked them. Two hundred thousand and a hundred and fifty people, small and large, male and female, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, cattle, and flocks without counting I drove out of their midst and reckoned as plunder. Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird within Jerusalem, his royal city, I enclosed him and encircled it with a siege wall. Well, that's uh, Sennacherib's account of what we're reading about here. And this is all happening now in the midst of uh, this Assyrian campaign that we're reading about. Uh, it's interesting, does, Paul, if yeah. I could just interject yes. here, that Sennacherib emphasizes what he conquered. 46 walled cities of Judah, yeah. over 200,000 captives, countless villages. I've excavated in some of these places. The destruction was devastating. 
But what he doesn't really dwell on right. is how <laughs> Jerusalem escaped him. Yes. He says, yeah, I had surrounded. Hezekiah in a bird, like a bird in a cage, but he never says that, he, that he's not able to get his hand into that cage to get the bird. That's right. And that's the part of the story, uh, a very bleak story in 36 and 37, yes. that, that we dwell on in our Bible, the, the salvation of Jerusalem, the, the silver lining of an otherwise very dark cloud. Yes. yes. Well, let's look a little bit at what Rob Shaquet says here. Uh, he, he's trying to intimidate the inhabitants of Jerusalem into capitulating. So in verse 5, he, uh, I say, uh, this is a quote actually that he is quoting from Sennacherib, and, and uh, perhaps a better translation might be, I say, you have, you've spoken vain words and think that that makes counsel and strength for war. Well, that's really a dumb idea, is what Sennacherib is saying. Because on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me, the king of Assyria? Uh, lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt. It, it, it is true that Hezekiah had tried to make an alliance with Egypt to help them in their rebellion against the Assyrians. And the Egyptians did actually come to oppose Sennacherib. And we know from his inscription, Sennacherib's inscription, that he soundly defeated them. Now, verse 7 is really interesting. Uh, this is psychological warfare at its best. Jeff, would you like to say something about that? Uh, the word, uh, uh, that is to say, the, the message from the king of Assyria to the people of Judah uh, is that um, uh, they've, been, they've been told to trust in the Lord, their God, the, the, the uh, Jehovah of Israel. And it's interesting that the Assyrian says to the people of Judah, is it not he, meaning the Lord your God, whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar? In other words, the Assyrians are saying to the Judeans standing there on the walls of Jerusalem, Hezekiah's fooled you. He's told you to worship Jehovah only in Jerusalem and at your temple. He's taken away all of the other altars to Jehovah and the other gods that were set up. Uh, the Assyrians are accusing Hezekiah of having insulted Jehovah by taking away all of the false altars and centralizing worship in Jerusalem. It sounds to me, though, like the Assyrians misunderstand. They totally misunderstand. That they, they see the, all the, or they've heard, their intelligence is very good. They've heard that all these altars have been taken down. They don't understand that he's cleansing the nation, that he's in, reinstituted Passover, that people are coming to worship in Jerusalem. They think the Judeans should be insulted by Hezekiah's reforms and his insistence yes. on monotheism, and perhaps many were. Uh, the reforms of Hezekiah did not totally take hold, which is probably the reason that the Lord allowed Ju uh, Judah to fall and so many deportees to be taken away. But in Jerusalem, which has to be saved, those reforms will abide. Yeah, the yes. king is there. And so in, in verse 10, we have him actually saying, uh, reading here a little bit to, from uh, inserting the Hebrew uh, uh, words in here. And I am now come, that is I, Sennacherib, am now come up with, am I come up without Jehovah against this land to destroy it? Jehovah said to me, Sennacherib, go against this land and destroy mm. it. Of course, this is a blatant <laughs> lie, but uh, it's meant to intimidate. And, uh, and then uh, he wants to continue on with this discussion of, uh, and, and warn the people on the wall, the ordinary people on the wall who are listening to all of this. And, and I think, uh, Jeff, you, you can concur in this, that, that this is probably the northern end of the city, or at least some place where, where the Assyrians can look at the wall on eye level and the people can see them at eye level. Probably and, so. Yeah, there are places like that in Jerusalem. Yes, yes. And... Uh, the Assyrians, of course, promised them in uh, uh, verses uh, 16 and 17 that if they, uh, he, actually they give them a choice. You can continue to resist and die, or you can capitulate and we will eventually take you into captivity. That's the choice the Assyrians give the Hezekiah and his people in Jerusalem. Well, Paul, I... let's make sure that our viewers understand exactly what he's saying, too, in verse 16 to quote that. <coughs> Uh, the, uh, the Assyrian officer says, Hearken not to Hezekiah, don't listen to him. Thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present. In other words, you, 
you give me the tribute and, and pay maybe some tribute, even, pay the maybe taxes even kill again. Hezekiah and throw his body outside the wall and make a present to me and repent. And then you can come out to me. I'll let you live. You'll eat every one of his vine, every one of his fig tree over the page. You'll drink every one of the waters of his cistern, verse 17, For until a time. Yep. I and come and take you until. away to yes. a land like your own land. I will still deport you, he says. Because of your rebellion, I'll still deport you, and Jerusalem won't be your city anymore. Yes. But in a sense, when you, when you look at where the Assyrians are coming from, what data do they have that would make them think otherwise? Yeah. Or have they been stopped? They, they haven't been stopped by no anyone. One, That's no the point of 18 through 20. And that's the whole point. Yeah. And, yes. and now they're running into a king who's taking a different approach. And that's that right. is, uh, we'll pit Jehovah against you. Yes. And they're saying, well, it work it hasn't worked in the past. What God has stopped us to this point? Right. Verse 18, hath any of the gods exactly. of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? So it's, up until this point, the answer is no. No one has no been yeah. delivered. So, Verse, but it's, it's a king against it, yes. God the king. It's, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's, well, this is a disturbing report. And, and so it's brought back to Hezekiah from those who are on the wall in, in uh, in the verse 22. And then we have the transition into chapter 20, uh, 37, which is the Lord's response to what the king of Assyria has said. And Hezekiah, of course, is a little bit worried. And as any good <laughs> king does, he goes to the prophet of the Lord, and we get the answer from the prophet of the Lord. Which is a great pattern here, too. We ought to just point out that uh, in these chapters, um, you, you, you see the work of a prophet. You see uh, Hezekiah uh, pleading and, and, and praying and beseeching God for not only strength but for answers. And then you see the answers coming through a prophet. It's Isaiah that comes on the scene and presents yeah. the information, thus saith the Lord. I think it's interesting that Hezekiah himself, he prays, he goes to the temple, he prays, pours out his heart to God. Yeah. But then he sends his emissaries to Isaiah to find out yeah. the Lord's answer. And that'll happen again and again. Yeah. I mean, it is a pattern. It's like a great triangle. You know, he keeps sending to Isaiah. The Lord sends the answer to Isaiah. Isaiah sends the answer back to Hezekiah. It's Let's a beautiful outline pattern. that quickly if we could. Chapter 37, 1 through 5. The king sends for the prophet Isaiah to consult with him. Mm -hmm. In chapter 37, 6 through 7, Isaiah gives a prophetic uh, oracle. I think that's worth reading. Yeah, an answer. Verse 6, Isaiah said to them, Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him. He will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. A prophecy that was going to be fulfilled. It would be fulfilled. Yeah. Yes. And so you move down through the chapter, and Hezekiah again will pray to the Lord. What's the background of that? Well, in in uh, uh, this section here, verses 8 through uh, 13, after the Lord has given the answer through Isaiah, uh, apparently they conveyed that answer to Rab Shakeh there, uh, and he's taking that answer back to Sennacherib. Rav Chakhe being the chief officer, the chief of, the officer Assyrians. of the Assyrians. Yeah, and not he's his taking name, a, but his title. Yeah, that's his, that's his, it's his, his title. Assyrian title. Sure. Yes. Yes. And uh, the answer is basically, no, we're not going to capitulate to you, Sennacherib. Okay. And therefore, uh, uh, Sennacherib in uh, verses 9, 10, 11, basically, and, and on from there, says, okay, uh, we will come against you then um, if you're not going to capitulate. And so the word comes back to Hezekiah that um, Sennacherib uh, is going to continue the siege of Jerusalem. And by a and letter. Yeah, by, by a letter. letter. And it's sent and by a letter. And he reads it. And he reads it there in verse 14. And in 15, Hezekiah again turns to the Lord. This is a, a, a wonderful man that we're dealing here with. And this prayer is spectacular. We ought to read just a few verses. Of and? It. <laughs> what do I? <laughs> yes. O oh, Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubim, of course He's, referring to the temple, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. You're the creator God. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, 
but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Just as uh, Hezekiah had destroyed the, the, the other idols yes. that had been around yeah. Judea before this time in his religious reforms. Yes, now, go ahead. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art Jehovah, even thou only. I just, I think every time we see that capital O, <laughs> L, capital O, capital R, capital D, it's hard not to say Jehovah because that's the God that he's known as to the Assyrians and to other people as well. Yes. And we get then in the next section, uh, uh, verses 21 through um, uh, 36, the Lord's answer to um, Hezekiah's prayer. A long prophetic answer. It's a answer. long prophetic answer. And I think we need to skip down to the end of it, to, uh, to around verse 36. Paul, let's point out as we do that, though, that this answer is coming not directly to Hezekiah, but through the prophet. Again, Isaiah yes. comes and speaks this to Hezekiah. Yes. It's the pattern. It's the pattern. It's the that's same right. pattern that's outlined at the beginning of the chapter uh, that Ray mentioned. Again, here we get it. You know, now, and if you, if you picture the two men, you know, the one... Uh, the king nervous about and, yeah and nervous about what's going on really nervous I mean I'm certain he was very very concerned for his people surrounded by Assyrians and then Isaiah with his strong words of <laughs> counsel, comfort, counsel and comfort yes it's confidence a, it's interesting to picture the two of them yes I, I think of Isaiah here as one of the great types of Christ oh yes when you think about the New Testament how often did Jesus in dealing with people uh, strengthen their faith. Uh, you remember the story of Jairus and, and his daughter who had died and, uh, and, and he has to encourage him uh, when, when he hears that she's passed away to, uh, to believe. Um, he is the great uh, sustainer of faith and, and that's exactly the role that Isaiah is playing right now is, yeah. is a shadow and a type of Christ uh, to encourage faith, to encourage belief. And, and heaven only knows that Hezekiah needed it right now. Yes, needed absolutely. it. Speaking of daughters, you know, before we skip to the end, let's just take uh, a few passages of the beginning of that in Isaiah 37, 21, whereas Isaiah comes and says to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken against him. Here come the daughters. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, Jerusalem, hath despised thee, Sennacherib, and laugh thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. In other words, Sennacherib, you've made an improper approach to me, and just like a beautiful young woman, I rebuke you. I scorn you. I scorn you. And, and the, the, the rest of the answer is beautiful, but probably we should cut to the chase. And Let's cut to the chase, because this will end the historical segment here. Uh, verse 33, Lord, maybe? Verse, uh, well, let's start with 35. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Mm. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. This is, sometimes when you read these, uh, these verses, they, they sound a little bit funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, they're all dead, and then they rise in the morning, and they see that they're all dead. Um, and in the, uh, the Joseph Smith translation, he, uh, he adds a nice little phrase here. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they who were left arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead. And so the king of Sennacherib departs. And in the meantime, he has left havoc and death and ruin behind him. All of Judea has been wasted except Jerusalem. And he goes home. Uh, we know from other sources because he also hears a rumor that uh, there is an insurrection at home. Yeah. And eventually, as uh, verse 38 uh, mentions, uh, many years later, he actually is killed by his sons in the temple there in his uh, capital city. In Nineveh there. In Nineveh, yes. <laughs> Now, we only have a few seconds left. Just, what do we a, learn from this? Well, just, just a quick, it's sort of ironic in, in verse 38 that, uh, that Sennacherib is killed while worshiping in the temple of his God. What has he been doing in this earlier chapter? He's been defaming the God of Israel as yes. though he had no power whatsoever to save his people. And yet the irony in the end is that he's in worshiping and praying to his own God. He's killed. He's yes. killed by his own He's family. He's killed by his own yeah, family. By his own sons. How, what irony. It is. Uh, yes. What irony. You know, imagine here, too, what would have happened if Jerusalem had fallen. 
If Jerusalem had fallen, mm -hmm. then Israel would have essentially become extinct in the Holy Land. The, the, those of Jerusalem would have been deported along with the 200,000 others of Judah. There would have been no Jerusalem as a Jewish Israelite city to survive till 600 B.C. so that there could be a Book of Mormon story. No Jewish Jerusalem to rebound and come back in the New Testament period so there could be a, a, a Messiah. And, and no Bible produced and, and no setting for a Latter-day Restoration. In verse 33 and 34, when the Lord said that, uh, particularly verse 34, I will defend this, this is, this is verse 35, pardon me, I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's oh, sake. Yes. Yeah. The Lord really had a stake in saving Jerusalem. It, it may have been in part because of David of old, but it's really because of the descendant of David that Jerusalem had to be saved. For Christ's sake, Jerusalem prevailed. It must remain a Jewish city through, through yeah. the time until uh -huh. Christ comes, yes. And the, the oath of, of God to David was that someone would sit on his throne, but of course they were not righteous, his own children, but coming through him would be Jesus Christ. Be the Messiah. Yeah. So I look at this in That's verse 35, I will save this city for Christ's sake, That's for Messiah's right. sake. That's right. And thus we come to the end of this uh, session on the book of Isaiah. It's been, uh, I think, very inspirational. The Lord is in charge. He knows what he's doing. And it doesn't matter what the people of the world say or think. The Lord's going to accomplish his purposes. Thank you. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.